Hello and welcome. I hope you are all are doing fine under these hard and trying circumstances and I hope you're all staying safe. As you can see, I am today recording from home. This is actually my wife's office at home and she has been kind enough to let me record this lecture here. And today I will begin my explanation of Terry Eagleton's chapter five on psychoanalysis. Now this is uh, quite a complex chapter, so I'm thinking of at least doing two lectures on it, and this is gonna be the first part of it. If you have read the chapter, you already know that it roughly has four parts. In part one, Eagleton explains to us as best as we can understand it, uh, Freud's own work on psychoanalysis. Then he gives us a brief overview of critiques that have been mounted against um, Freud and his work. Critiques from feminists, critiques from other uh, scholarly directions. Then he gives us a brief account of Lacan's uh, rewriting of Freud or reimagining of Freud. And along with it, he also gives us Julia Kristeva's take on it. And then towards the end, he also gives us examples of how psychoanalysis can be used as a mode of literary criticism and how people have used it. And he actually, this is one of the very few chapters where he actually applies it to a novel, right? So these are some of the parts in today's lecture, I'll primarily focus on Eagleton's explanation of Freud and his basic concepts. I will also be relying on some outside sources, and I hope that you will be able to see my slides as well. So uh, let me bring my slides up so that you can see them. And let's see how it works. I, I'm on my wife's computer, so it's kind of, for me, going back and forth is going. So uh, if, you, if you're reading the text on the very first page, right? Let me make this text bigger. Uh, he gives us this quote on page 131, which says, the motive of human society is in the last resort an economic one. Now, most of us, would associate it with Marx. I mean, it was Marx who also said that, you know, the motive of human society in the last instance is an economic one, that things are determined by economics in the last instance when we figure it out. This was actually Freud who said that. And then he gives us, Eagleton on the same page, gives us an account of how Freud imagined, right, human beings, right? which is very close to Marx. I mean, of course, Marx probably adapted it from this. What has dominated human history to date is the need to labor. And for Freud, that harsh necessity means that we must repress some of our tendencies to pleasure and gratification. Now, this homo faber, this human being who needs to be productive needs to work in Marx is very humanistically rendered, right? And is made an essential part of who we are. But here in Freud, there is a slight twist. And the twist is that in order to sustain life, we as humans, you know, need to work. We are essentially pleasure seeking animals, right? And that tendency to labor, to learn certain skills, right? That is what forces us to repress seeking immediate gratification, immediate pleasure, right? Uh, so, but one thing that I saw that was missing in this chapter is that uh, Eagleton doesn't give us like a, an, a, a whole uh, concerted account of the three parts of psyche that Freud theorizes, right? And that you already know, it's the id, the ego and superego. So I can't even read my own slide, but I'll see according to Freud's model, the id is the primitive and instinctual part of the mind. 
that contains sexual and aggressive drives and hidden memories. The superego operates as a moral conscience and the ego is the realistic part that mediates between the desires of the id and the superego. So let's say we human beings in Freudian terms then, when we are children, we are pure id, led by the desires and led by the drives. Now remember, the drives are instinctual, right? Hunger, sex, right? Aggressiveness, these are instinctual. Now the ego is that part of our psyche that kind of keeps the drives at check. It's the, it's the rational principle, right? So, or the reality principle, right? So the id, according to Freud, is the pleasure principle. It seeks immediate fulfillment. Ego is the one that kind of tempers it. And the way ego tempers it, because ego is privy to the superego, the larger structure of power, the society, whatever its norms are. So ego mediates between the id and the superego. And these are the three, three functional parts of the psyche in Freud. Now, if we go to the next page in the same chapter, right? Um, I'm still trying to find my presentation, uh, sorry. So on the very next page, Eagleton gives us a definition of neurosis, right? And the reason he's doing it, I'll explain in a minute. What he's saying is we are, what we are prepared to put up we are prepared to put up with repression as long as we see that there is something in it for us. If too much is demanded of us, however, we are likely, likely to fall sick. This form of sickness is known as neurosis. And since, as I've said, all human beings must be repressed to some degree, it is possible to speak of a human race in the words of one of Freud's comment as the neurotic animal. So first of all, repression. So if we are led by the id, and id is instinctual desires, and there is a superego that tells us what we can and cannot do, and the ego that mediates between the two, then most of the times as functional human beings in the world, we have to repress certain tendencies, certain desires. That means pretty much the entire edifice of this civilization is built on, the balance is built on those repressions. Now, for as long as we can convince ourselves that if I repress this desire and this desire, there'll be a better outcome for me, right? Then we can sustain it. But if we don't see any end to our repressions and there is no reward for it, that is when we become neurotic, right? We will become psychotic when we start imagining things, right? At somebody. So neurosis is when we are terrified of things, right? It's coming from our psyche. A psychosis is when we see, you know, things that are not there, right? And that's the subtle difference between the two. But the reason he's bringing up neurosis here is that the question is about civilization. If it is built on repression, then pretty much all human beings, you know, are neurotic. Right? And if we are neurotic, what kind of a civilization have we built? That's the big question. But then he gives us the reason. Why is it that human beings are considered the neurotic animals? Right? Because what animals could be that, but we can't access their consciousness. But the reason that Eagleton is giving us through Freud is because what he says is that I'm going to the next slide, but what he's saying is that we are, human beings are the only pretty much species who are born helpless. And since we are completely born helpless, we require the care of those who love us, feed us, clothe us for a very long period. And that long period is our developmental period. And because of that, there is sufficient time and dependency for us to develop as these neurotic animals, right? Because of that dyad first, the child and the mother, and when it becomes the triad, when the figure of the father enters, what Freud then means is that we develop certain psyche because of that dependence, right? And, uh, 
Okay, so if we are led by the id, right, and uh, we the id wants to follow its instinctual desire, which is the pleasure principle. And if we find out that there is something that we want to do, but it's not permissible, then we sublimate it, right? So we're also kind of sublimating it. So instead of following our sexual drives, right, our sexual tendencies, we invest the same energy into something that is socially permissible, right? Playing with dogs, right? Building bridges, right? Or all the philanthropy and other stuff that rich people do is all sublimating whatever they want to do. And if they cannot do it, you sublimate it into something that is socially permissible, right? So that's also another one of Freudian concept that we are made aware of. And then you know, we get the answer on page 132 again, why only humans are neurotic or repressed, right? And the, I already explained to you, it's because we have a very longer period of development. And what is that development? Freud gives us, you know, five stages of human development. So the first one is the oral stage from birth to one year. This is the time when the mouth is the erogenous zone, right? And the child, right, seeks pleasure, right? Freud would say it's sexual, right? But the first contact of a child is with the mother's breast. That is from where the food comes to the child's mouth. But in the process of consuming milk, that food, the child also discover, is discovering that it gives him or her pleasure. Then comes the anal stage from one to three years, right? In that case, the erogenous zone is the bladder control, the bowels, right? Uh, the child also learns control and realizes that by controlling, by withholding feces, he or she can control the parents, right? The phallic stage is from three to six years, right? That's when the child, according to Freud, becomes aware of the genitalia, is obsessed with the genitalia, right? And this is all those are also the stage where the child will resolve or enter the Oedipus complex, right? Now, the Oedipus complex in Freud is mostly rendered in male terms. Freud is pretty silent on, not silent, but misguided on female psyche. So what is the Oedipus complex? Uh, let me explain it here instead of waiting, waiting, you know, um, until later. So if you know the story of Oedipus, right? Oedipus Rex, coming from Greek mythology, right? Um, the house of thieves, the most tragic of them all, right? Oedipus uh, was sent to was sent out to be killed, but the slave who was supposed to kill him leaves him because there was a prophecy that he will kill his own father. Eventually, when he's coming back to Thebes, he runs into a stranger, kills him accidentally, I think, or kills him in a sports arena because his discus hits the king, and eventually marries his own mother, has children. And then when he realizes, when he finds out that the cause of the pestilence in his kingdom is because he has married his own mother. It's that myth that Freud is using to define the term Oedipus complex, right? In Freud, in the phallic stage, that is when the child encounters the Oedipus complex, and the complex is that the child still desires the mother's body, right? But he suddenly realizes that that body belongs to the father. The dyad is now becoming a triad, right? And he has to resolve that conflict. The resolution is where he accepts that this body belongs to my father. But if I follow the rules, if I follow the law of the father, right, then eventually one day I'll get to have this body too. And it's that resolution that would then leave the child to a balanced next stage to a latent period, right? Which is from puberty. And in this time zone, six to puberty, 
sexual feelings are inactive, the child has now become social. And so the development of ego and superego, because the Oedipus complex kind of must have been resolved, the child has now reached a stage where he becomes more social, right? And uh, more things become important, peer pressure, how the others view you, relationships, hobbies, right? And then from puberty to death is what is what Freud calls the genital stage. And while the earlier stages were focused on individual needs, this one, if the previous stages have been passed carefully and correctly, you know, this stage is where you one lives their life, right? Well balanced, right? With sexual interests and seeking a partner. And most probably the child would have, according to Freud, resolved that he or she is heterosexual, right? That's also part of the whole deal of resolution of Oedipus complex. Then on page 134 to 136, um, Freud gives us this explanation of pleasure versus reality principle. I already briefly talked about it, right? Uh, so, you know, in um, the early stages, when the child is led by the drives, by the instincts, right? And the instincts seek immediate pleasure, but it's the law of the father, the law of the phallus, right? Which forces the child to encounter the reality principle that there is a limit to his or her desires, and that limit is the law of the father, right? The presence of the father and negotiating the two, learning to withhold pleasure. That's done through reality principle, through the function of the ego, right? Now, moving on, <laughs> it's a lot, I know. Uh, the next part that he discusses is uh, the same on the same page is that it's the promise of a future, you know, following the rules. If I follow the rules, I will get the reward. The body of the mother that the child desires is that encourages the child when his desires come to in conflict with the reality that the reality principle forces us, right? To control our desires, to repress them. That brings us to the unconscious, to the discussion of the unconscious on page 136. Because whatever we repressed, according to Freud, right? It doesn't go away, right? It rep it's repressed into the unconscious. So the F Freud has a very a topographical model of the conscience. So reason, reason, rational consciousness is on the top. Just under it is the subconscious, which is aware of what's happening. And then the unconscious, which is completely inaccessible to rational thought, right? That's where our repressions go and live. And that's what Eagleton is explaining on page 136, right? What does he say? The human subject who emerges from the Oedipal process is a split subject torn precariously between conscious and unconscious. And the unconscious can always return to plague it, right? Because that's where repressions live. It under so what he says, most people call it the subconscious, but that kind of underestimates the radicality of the term unconscious, right? It underestimates the extreme strangeness of the unconscious, which is a place and a non-place which is completely indifferent to reality, which knows no logic or negation or causality or contradiction, wholly given over as it is to the instinctual play of the drives and the search for pleasure. So as a territory, right, the unconscious is unmappable. It doesn't follow the rational logic. It doesn't have an arrangement like a catalog, right? But there are ways to access it, right? Because that is where our repressions go and live, right? Now, when the un 
conscious throws them back at us, right? It doesn't do a good job, according to Freud. It mixes things up, makes them into metaphors, right? Makes them metonymic, but it can give us one thing instead of the other. It's not a really good editor. And the one way where we can access the unconscious is in dreams, right? Right. The royal road to the unconscious is dreams. Dreams allow us one of our few privileged glimpses of it at work. Dreams for Freud are essentially symbolic fulfillments of unconscious wishes. And they are cast in symbolic form because if this material were expressed directly, then it might be shocking and disturbing enough to wake us up. In order that we should get some sleep, the unconscious charitably conceals, softens, and distorts its meanings so that our dreams become symbolic texts which need to be deciphered. The watchful ego is still at work even within our dreaming, censoring an image here or scrambling a message there, and the unconscious itself adds to this obscurity by its peculiar, peculiar modes of functioning. Right. So this is all it, that's happening in our unconscious as we sleep. Right. All that the desires that we have stressed, immediate and long term. Right. The unconscious throws it back at us. Right. But it's still wary. It doesn't want to wake us up. There is still a little bit of censorship going on. So it gives this those dreams to us in jumbled form, in metaphoric form, in symbolic terms, right? That's why one of the works that most psychoanalysts will ask you is that you should record your dreams, right? Even when we give writing advice to people and we want them to be able to access their you know, inner thoughts, we tell them, okay, do a journal as soon as you wake up because it allows you to capture whatever you know, whatever it was in your dreams. But one access to the unconscious then is through dreams, right? Uh, I also use another example is that we all are aware of it, that if our rational mind, you know, is dulled, we are likely to express something or say something that will be socially not accepted. Think of it this way. How many times have you told your friends Oh, when you go out, you know, don't get too drunk. Or how many times you have you reminded yourself not to drink too much if you're amongst people who are not your friends, certainly not drink before a job interview. All of it is premised upon this belief that if our rational mind is dulled, is, is asleep, is slowed down, then the unconscious will express itself. Maybe it will not know the no the the moral or social norm, right? And another way on page 137, Eagleton says is that we can access the unconscious is dreams, but also what Freud calls, you know, parapraxis or what we call a Freudian slip. Sometimes we, in the middle of saying something else, something slips out. It can be sexist, it can be homophobic, it can be something that we would otherwise be horrified to say, but it slips up, right? Jokes are another way where our repressed ideas, repressed thoughts are expressed because they allow us that space to be facetious while saying silly things, things that we will not say in a serious conversation, right? But overall, the unconscious remains you know, sort of a uncharterable, unmappable territory. Now, all of this that Freud is doing, his research and all, is with this belief that we can cure people's mental illness, their paranoia, right, if they are psychotic or neurotic. And the process, what we call the talking cure, you know, is 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 that first of all we should be able to access what a person has repressed right because what we do 
physically is an expression of whatever is repressed. That's what we call the return of the, what is, is repressed is expressing itself in destructive behaviors, right? And so the idea is if we could access the unconscious through dream work, through talking about traumas, then maybe after we have encountered it, what we had repressed and released it, we will maybe become whole and be able to function normally. Now, what Freud is saying is that this happens through transference, okay? What is transference? When me, the patient, is talking to an analyst, you know, the analyst is not going to judge me, but the analyst is constantly asking me these questions to probe my own unconscious, to probe my own consciousness. Now, if I have repressed something deeply private, I will get angry, right? I will then transfer my anger and aggression on to the analyst, right? So the nub of the cure for Freudian theory is what is known as transference, a concept sometimes properly conceived with Freud calls projection, but it's not necessarily projection. What does Freud mean by it? Let's see. In the course of a treatment, the analyzant, or patient may begin unconsciously to transfer on to the figure of the analyst, the physical conference from which he or she suffers, right? Now, as he or she is transferring it to the analyst, the analyst is taking it down, right? Breaking it down into manageable, rational parts and narrating it back to the patient. And by virtue of this drama of transference, and the insight and the interventions which it permits the analyst, the patient's problems are gradually redefined in terms of the analytical situation itself. Me stating to you, the patient, oh, this is what probably what is going on. In this sense, paradoxically, the problems which are handled in the consulting room are never quite at one with the real life problems of the patient. They have, have something of the fictional relation to those real life problems, which a literary text has to the real life materials. It transforms. So what happens then in a session is not that we encourage our patient to encounter their trauma and then resolve it, but the session allows the patient to create a sustainable narrative. It doesn't even have to be true. It only may have a part of the trauma, but a cohesive narrative, and it is that narrative that enables the patient to heal themselves, according to Freud. And it is that story. Another way of describing, Eagleton says, this process is to say that the patient becomes able to recollect portions of her life which she has repressed. She is able to recount a new, more complete narrative about herself, one which will interpret and make sense of the disturbances from which she suffers. The talking cure, as it is called, will have taken effect after the patient has developed a new narrative, after having confronted, with the help of an analyst, the traumas which were embedded in his or her consciousness. Now, towards the end of this section then, Eagleton gives us one of Freud's statements, maybe a final statement about civilization. And I think it's pertinent for us even today. And I quote, if a society has not developed beyond a point at which the satisfaction of one group of its members depends upon the suppression of another, it is understandable that those suppressed should develop an intense hostility towards a culture whose existence their labor has made possible, but in whose riches they have too small a share. It goes without saying, Freud declares, that a civilization which leaves so large a number of its participants unsatisfied 
and drives them into revolt, neither has nor deserves the prospect of a lasting existence. I, I think it's a really moving passage. We will associate it with Marx, right? Those of us who are Marxist, but that is Freud. And think of our civilization, where we exist, the world in which we live. We absolutely know that happiness of a few depends upon the oppression of a majority of the population of this planet, but we somehow still think that it's a sustainable system. Psychologically, it is not. And if you really want to know what this system is doing to our psyches, right, please watch my video on Franco Berardi's The Soul at Work, right? I'll probably post a link to it here, but do watch it. He explains it better what psychosomatic traumas are affecting our bodies. To, to, to sum up this part of the chapter, what we are introduced to then is what are Freud's basic concepts, right? How does he divide the psyche you, into the conscious brain, the subconscious and the unconscious? Then, what are the three parts of the psyche, the id, the ego, and the superego, right? And the five stages of development. And through that, the resolution of the Oedipus complex, which is absolutely necessary, according to Freud, for a male subject to resolve their conflict with the father and become so-called normal. And then the unconscious is the place where all our repressions go and reside, and it throws them back at us in dreams or in slippages of tongues, the unconscious expressions, parapraxis, or Freudian slips that we call it. And towards the end, the whole process of transference and developing of new narrative of confronting the traumas with the help of an analyst. And that's crucial. The dream work is crucial. And this is crucial because that is what Eagleton would eventually connect to what can be useful in literary theory. There is also a brief reference in this section that I've talked about to Lacan and how Lacan takes certain aspects of structuralist linguistics and then correspondingly tries to explain the unconscious in those terms. But I will talk about that in the next lecture. So that is all I have for today about the first part of my lecture on Eagleton's chapter five on psychoanalysis. If you have any questions, any concerns, please send them my way, post a comment, email me, and I'll be happy to answer all those questions. And I will soon record part two of this lecture as well. So stay tuned for that. And before I leave, stay safe. Right. Take care of yourself. Take care of those around you in these times. And as always, peace and love. Hello. Welcome back. I am back again with a lecture still on Chapter 5 um, of Terry Eagleton, Part 2. Um, that's what my hope is today. Now, I had planned to finish this in two lectures, but it seems like I'll only be able to deal with a certain part of the chapter today, primarily uh, criticisms of Freud that Eagleton talks about, and then the part where he discusses uh, Jacques Lacan. And then after that, I think I'll do a third lecture where he brings everything together and gives us an example of how psychoanalysis can be used uh, in uh, doing literary analysis. So that's my plan. Thank you so much for joining me. So uh, if uh, you have not watched part one of this lecture, just keep that in mind. Uh, we had uh, finished primarily Eagleton's discussion of Freud and some of the major concepts of Freud. And that's where we had left part one of this lecture on chapter five. And now uh, I will move into part two and I have some slides that I will be using. Uh, I'm gonna make it bigger on the screen so that you can see it. 
And this starts like on page 140 is where he tells us, okay, here are some criticisms of Freud that come from different directions, okay? There are problems, he says, for instance, about how it would test its doctrines, about what would count as evidence for or against its claims. And that criticism comes because Freud claims that psychoanalysis is a science, right? And that it can cure people. So one of the biggest criticism that comes is, you know, how just like in scientific research, is it repeatable? Um, you know, how do, how do we know that an infant feels like that? Can we prove it? Or is it just purely theory? The, we've already talked about the emphasis on sex and he talks what Eagleton is talking about it and I quote, the sexist values we have touched on already are a case in point, okay? So we already know that Freud's encounter with the psyche is mostly expressed in male terms, right? And he doesn't really give more credence to female sexuality or female psyche and that then opens him to the charge of sexism and what Eagleton says about him is that uh, Freud was probably no more patriarchal in attitude than most other 19th century Viennese males but his view of women as passive narcissistic masochistic and penis envying less morally conscious than men has been scathingly criticized by feminists. So that's one of the criticism that comes from the feminists, right? Um, another criticism of Freud, Freud, what he talks about is that the psychoanalysis uh, as a medical practice is a form of oppressive social control, labeling individuals and forcing them to conform to arbitrary, arbitrary definitions of normality. So part of it is that psychoanalysis has the power to label people, right? But then it also, how do you label people? You label people by, by positing what is normal. So as a, as a discipline, as a practice, then it has the power to label people, to differentiate them from other, to decide whether or not they are normal. Now, this is more relevant to psychiatry and not psychoanalysis, because in psychiatry then, uh, because we rely on medicine to balance chemical imbalances. So if you look at the practice in the school system, putting kids on Ritalin and others, that it's more relevant to that where clinical psychology, what it is called, but it has the power to label people and define people. And to some extent, psychoanalysis does that too. And that's one criticism that Eagleton talks about on page 141. Another one, what he talks about is a mere commonsensical impatience. How could a little girl possibly desire her father's baby, right? I mean, these are like simplistic commonsensical questions. Whether this is true or not, it's not common sense, which will allow us to decide. One should remember the sheer bizarreness. So what Eagleton is saying, these kind of criticism, forget, they simplify what Freud is saying, that, that the unconscious is this uncharted, bizarre, unregulated space, right? Uh, I have heard this criticism from uh, a couple of my Pakistani scholar friends, like when they talk about Freud, they are basically saying, well, we can't have that kind of love for the body of the mother because we are Muslims and, um, you know, that's an absolute no, no. But what they are imagining is an adult person. Freud isn't talking about the adult person. That love for the body of the mother, according to Freud, happens pre-lingual stage, right? In infancy, that is his point. And when we are at that point, we are neither Muslims, Christians, or anyone else. But these are some of the criticism, commonsensical criticisms that Eagleton is pointing out, which sometimes are not necessarily valid because they absolutely reduce Freud to a commonsensical understanding of things, right? 
Another criticism that he talks about uh, that Freud brings everything down to sex, that he is in the technical term a pansexualist, right? And uh, Eagleton's argument is that, that the seed of truth in pansexualist charges that Freud regarded sexuality as central enough to human life to provide a component for all our activities. But what Eagleton argues on page 141 is that, that Freud is more than that. Well, he uses these psychosexual stages and terms, but he is by no means reducing human beings simply to sex or to their libido. Another criticism of Freud heard on the political left, he says, is that his thinking is individualistic that he substitutes private psychological causes and explanations for social and historical ones. But Eagleson says that's absurd, right? Because what he says is that Freud never detaches the psyche from the social, right? And here is his response, Eagleton's. He says, what Freud produces in these deed is nothing less than a materialist theory of the making of the human subject. We come to be what we are by an interrelation of bodies, by the complex transactions which take place during infancy between our bodies and those which surround us. This is not a biological reductionism. Freud does not, of course, believe that we are nothing but our bodies or that our minds are mere reflexes of them, but that we exist in the social, right? And that's why psychoanalysis absolutely believes that outside forces impact our psyche. The social has an impact on it. So that criticism that he reduces it to the private affair, also according to Eagleton, doesn't hold. And then, as promised, Eagleton moves to Lacan, right? Now, Lacan's work is complex. It's also highly contested. And I am going to admit here that other than a few, you know, excerpts and some uh, explanations of Lacan, I myself have, have not read much of Lacan. I've read a lot of works like my friend Mark Brockers uh, who rely on Lacanian psychoanalysis. I've read, read people like Kristeva and others who build on uh, Lacan's legacy. But here I'm just going to share with you Eagleton's explanation of Lacan, right? And he starts with this. He says, Lacan's work is strikingly original attempt to rewrite Freud Freudianism in ways relative to all those concerned with the question of human subject its place in society, and above all, its relationship to language. This last concern is why Lacan is also of interest to literary theorists, because Lacan uses structuralist and post-structuralist linguistics and theory to explain the psyche, and it is that then becomes crucial in using him in literary studies, because he is using the theories of language, right? What Lacan seeks to do in his book, Ecritus, is to interpret Freud in the light of structuralist and post-structuralist theories of discourse. Now, I'm hoping that you understand, by now you have watched my lectures on structuralism and post-structuralism, and that you also understand Foucault's theory of discourse. If you don't, I have a another brief lecture on it on my YouTube channel, you can watch it. But this, these are the reasons Lacan becomes crucial for literary scholars because of his emphasis on language theory, on definition of the sign and the differential sign, but also on the theory of discourse, right? Now, remember, uh, like, there were five stages that we discussed for Freud, right? Uh, you know, the anal stage, the phallic stage. You, here, Lacan gives us, I think, three stages. The mirror stage, 
before the mirror stage is the stage of the real, right? Where the child is one with the body of the mother. That's the only thing we have. That's the biological connection. And then comes a moment when the child enters the mirror stage. Now the mirror stage is, Eagleton explains it, the child who is still physically uncoordinated finds reflected back to itself in the mirror a gratifyingly unified image of itself. And although its relation to this image is still of an imaginary kind, this is what we call the imaginary order in Lacan, right? The image in the mirror both is and is not itself. A blurring of subject and object still obtains. It has begun the process of constructing, constructing a center of the self. So by seeing one's own image in the mirror, seeing oneself as a whole, right? But also this other in the mirror is the mirror stage in which the child starts constructing an idea of self. And as the mirror reflects a complete self, right? In the imaginary realm, that's the Lacanian imaginary, the child finds his or herself as centered, as a fully realized subject. Now, the imaginary for Lacan is precisely this realm of images in which we make identification. But in the very act of doing so, and this is Eagleton, I'm reading it out, are led to misperceive and misrecognize ourselves. What is the misrecognition? We misrecognize ourselves as I, right? As whole, as centered, right? As the child grows up, it will continue to make such imaginary identifications with objects. And this is how its ego will be built up. For Lacan, the ego is just this narcissistic process whereby we bolster up a fictive sense of unitary selfhood by finding something in the world with which we can identify, right? That still is the imaginary, right? Ima imaginary phase as we are considering a register of being in which there are really no more than two terms, the child itself and the other body, which at this point is usually the mother, right? This is the imaginary, this is in the mirror state. The figure of the father has not yet entered, so the relationship is a dyad of two within which the child in the mirror stage, in the imaginary, finds his or herself completing an idea of self, right? But the relationship is still with the mother. But when the father enters in the figure, in, the, in this process, the father represents the law, right? That's why, or the phallus. Not literal, but figurative. And so Eagleton calls it on page 143, the father signifies what Lacan calls the law, which is in the first place, the social taboo on incest. The child is disturbed in its libidinal relation with the mother and must begin to recognize in the figure of the father that a wider familiar and social network exists of which the child itself is only a part. So as soon as the figure of the father enters, right, the child's relationship with the mother comes to crisis because the child starts realizing, right, that in order to move into this world, this is the person the father, the phallus, whose law I must learn. So the appearance of the father, Eagleton says on page 143, divides the child from the mother's body. And in doing so, as we have seen, drives its desires underground into the unconscious. In this sense, the first appearance of the law and the opening up of unconscious desire occur at the same moment. It is only when the child acknowledges the taboo or prohibition which the father symbolizes that it represses its guilty desire and that desire just is what, it's, what is called the unconscious. So the moment the law of the father enters the imaginary order, right? The child then learns 
the law of the father and starts repressing things that are not permissible under the law of the father, right? So in the imaginary realm, in the imaginary stage, then a new thing is emerging. And that is where things start going back into the unconscious. Before this, the child had had no reason to suppress things, right? So we are moving from id to ego to the realm of the superego under the law of the father, okay? And the moment the child realizes this, the child enters language, right? And when you enter language, that for Lacan is the symbolic order, right? And how does Eagleton talk about it? With the entry of the father, the child is plunged into post-structuralist anxiety. It now has to grasp such Shore's point that identities come about only as a result of differences, that one term or subject it what is what it is only by excluding another. Significantly, the child's first discovery of sexual difference occurs at about the same time that it is discovering language itself. The baby's cry is not really a sign, but a signal. It indicates that it is cold, hungry, or whatever. In gaining access to language, the small child unconsciously learns that a sign has meanings only by dint of its difference from other signs, and learns also that a sign presupposes the absence of the object it signifies. So this is Lacan using Sochorian linguistic to explain the psyche, but especially the unconscious, the post-structuralist anxieties, what are those? That signs have no substantial meaning, that meaning is through difference, that even then there is a lot of slippage. All of these things in Lacanian psychoanalysis is what the unconscious is, right? That is where things are indeterminate, right? Um, there is no final word, no final signification, no transcendental signified. And that, the symbolic order, right? And how does Lacan then handle Oedipus complex? The presence of the father, symbolized by the phallus, figurative, not literal, teaches the child that it must take up a place in the family which is defined by sexual difference, by exclusion, it cannot be its parents' love, and by absent, it must relinquish its earlier bond to mother's body. Its identity as a subject it comes to perceive is constituted by its relations of difference and similarity to other subjects around it. Now, this is completely structuralist. Remember when we talked about the sign system and so sure, the sign did not have its own substantial meaning. It is, if it's in a semiological chain, it is in relation to other signs. And then on a larger scale, it means something because of its difference from other signs, right? Um, so accepting all of this, the child moves from the imaginary register into what Lacan calls the symbolic order. The pre-given structure of social and sexual roles and relation which makes up the family and society. In Freud's own term, it has successfully negotiated the painful passage through the Oedipus complex. So when in Lacan, when the child leaves the imaginary order, right, and enters the indeterminacy, the openness, the differences, right, understanding his or her gender in difference to others, right, that is when a child has successfully negotiated the Oedipus complex by accepting the law of the father, right? And moving into the symbolic order. Now the symbolic order is symbolic because it has language. And if it has language, and that language is informed by post-structuralist and structuralist concepts of language, then we already know that it's not going to be a linear, very easy to pin down language. We are entering the realm of the language, which is the symbolic order and which has all the ramifications that we learned about 
the indeterminacy of signs, the sign working through systems, that there being no transcendental signified, no transcendental signifier, all of those anxieties then are part of the symbolic order. So language and symbolic order on page 145, Eagleton explains this. The child must now resign itself to the fact that it can never have any direct access to reality, in particular to the now prohibited body of the mother. It has been banished from this full imaginary possession into the empty world of language. I'll explain that in a minute. Language is empty because it is just an endless process of difference and absence. Instead of being able to possess anything in its fullness, the child will now simply move from one signifier to another along a linguistic chain, which is potentially infinite. So the reason the child had that stability before entering the symbolic order was because it was prelingual, right? And it was based in the mirror stage with a relationship with the body of the mother. The moment the child enters the language, and it is the structuralist language and post-structuralism, then the symbolic order is the place where a child having passed into the symbolic order can never claim to have the real experience. Just as in linguistics, we learned that representations of the signs are not natural. We never really reach the real meaning of the signs. Right? We always have one signification or the other. We don't really know the sign because of its essence, but because of its difference from other signs. All of those variants play a role in the symbolic order. Okay. I know it's getting kind of boring, but okay. So in also in the imaginary order, right, or imaginary register, the object A, the big A was the body of the mother. Right now, since the child has learned the law of the father and cannot desire it in the symbolic order, then a child would constantly keep looking for something to fulfill that gap, to fulfill that lack. And that is what is called object small a in Lacan. After the Oedipus crisis, we will never again be able to attain this precious object A, capital even though we will spend all of our lives hunting for it, we have to make do instead with substitute objects, what Lacan calls the object with a little a. We mainly try to plug the gap at the very center of our being. We move among substitutes for substitutes, metaphors for metaphors, never able to recover the pure, effective self-identity and self-completion which we knew in the imaginary. And we knew that because our knowledge of self, though imagined, was not constructed by language, right? Now this, uh, here I would also like to explain uh, Lacan's, you know, uh, concept of the lack, right? We need to understand it because that's what Deleuze and Guattari challenge this idea because he's using language wrong. And what he's saying is that we move from one sign to another in a semiological chain. Why? Because we lack the next sign. So it's that lack that drives us, that creates the desire to move to the next significant. And the next, the object A, the substitutes that we seek in life to replace the big A, right, is all because of this lack that we feel after we have left the imaginary stage and entered the symbolic order, and that lack drives our quest, right? Okay, getting a bit complicated here. Okay, so the unconscious for Lacan, as we have seen in our discussion of Freud, this is Eagleton, regards the unconscious as structure like language. Okay, that's what Lacan, we have already established that he is structuralist and post-structuralist. This is not only because it works by metaphor and metonymy. It is also because like language itself for the post-structuralist, it is composed less of signs, stable meanings, than of signifiers. If you dream of a horse, horse it is not immediately obvious what this signifies. 
It may have many contradictory meaning. It may just be one of a whole chain of signifiers with equally multiple meanings. So the reason the unconscious, now remember when we discussed Freud, we knew that the unconscious is this place without order in jumbled, where things exist, where our repressions exist in jumbled forms. And when it gives us something in our dreams, it codes it, right, metaphorically, or gives us a symbol of something. Similarly here, if we are gonna render the unconscious as a language, then it is imbued with all the problems of post-structuralist linguistics, right? Uh, slippages, right? indeterminacy of the signs, the, the imperfect metaphors that we use. All of that for Lacan is the unconscious. That why, that's why the unconscious for Lacan is like language. Right? So the unconscious, uh, and this is Eagleton on page 146, the unconscious is just a continual movement and activity of signifiers whose signifieds are often inaccessible to us because they are repressed. Right? Think of it that way. This is why Lacan speaks of the unconscious as a sliding of signified signifier, that we have something, but what it means or what we desire has been repressed as a constant fading and evaporation of meaning a bizarre modernist text, which is almost unreadable and which will certainly never yield up its final secrets to the interpretation. Now that's the unconscious, right? Multiple meanings, right? Not knowing whether we can trust what's there, right? Whether never finding a stable meaning. So think of the modernist text, right? Ulysses, right? Virginia Woolf, um, you know, um, many of Faulkner's works, right? LA dying, is they deal with this idea, one particular characteristics of a modernist text is that it doesn't promise to represent the real. And it forces us to question what it is offering, whether it's valid or not, whether there are hidden meanings behind meanings. Remember Ulysses, Joyce's Ulysses, has a 700 page companion book in which just explains the allusions to us, right? So that's, this is also where Eagleton has started making connections between Lacan and the literary text, right? In the next lecture, we will go there how to use, okay? So then in Lacan on one page, page 146, uh, Eagleton also then explains what is the function of the ego. The ego or consciousness can therefore only work by repressing this turbulent activity, provisionally nailing down words to meanings. This turbulent activity of dealing with language with multiple connotations and meanings, right? Every now and then a word from the unconscious, which I do not want, insinuates itself into my discourse. And this is the famous Freudian slip, right? But for Lacan, all our discourse is, is in a sense a slip of the tongue. If the process of language is as slippery and ambiguous as he suggests, we can never mean precisely what we say and never say precisely what we mean, okay? So the function of the ego is to give us some order, right? But we know that that order is artificial, right? That it's provisional because the way our unconscious works or the way our mind works is like language. And it's the structuralist and post-Sashorian, post-structuralist language. So the function of ego is to give us some form of fictive stability, right? And then, so there's a complex sentence on page 147, you can read it, but the, what he's talking about is the inner subject of the, of the enunciating, the person who speaks, the actual speaking, writing human person can never represent himself or herself fully in what is said. There is no sign which will, so to speak, sum up my entire being. I can only designate myself in language by a convenient pronoun, the pronoun, I stands 
in for the ever elusive subject, which will always slip through the nets of any particular piece of language. And this is equivalent to saying that I cannot mean and be simultaneously and be simultaneously to make this point Lacan boldly rewrites Descartes, I think, therefore I am, as I am not where I think, and I think where I am not, right? So the ego then in Lacan, if we read it through linguistics, through Saussurean linguistics and post-structuralist linguistics, right? So this identity that we take, the psyche that Masood Raja or you or I, it's not a stable I. It means that I, because at that moment, within that structure of language, that is all I can be. So this whole idea that we can somehow reach a truth and represent it in the symbolic order becomes impossible because we've already learned in structuralism and post-structuralism that language can never really represent the real, right? And there is no way of accessing the real through language because language by its very nature cannot capture that, right? And so what we have then is endless chains of signifiers, right? And provisionally at any given moment, you know, we understand each other, right? But we never take it as I have understand your stood uh, your real essence or, or you have understood my real essence. That understanding is always based in our understanding that language is the medium that speaks through us or through which we exist and speak, right? Mm -hmm. So this is roughly up to page 147, starting from I think 141 is Eagleton's discussion of Lacan, how Lacan defines, rewrites Freud with the insights of structural and post-structural linguistics, how he gives us three stages, the mirror stage, the imaginary, and the symbol. The imaginary is the prelingual, the child in that stage has a fictive idea of a complete self, but the moment the child enters the symbolic order, that idea of the self is no longer accessible. There is always a lack and we try to fill it through substitutes, through sublimation, through seeking other objects of desire. And it's that lack that's crucial in Lacan. Now remember, Deleuze and Gautari have a lot of fun with the lack, right? And then Eagleton spends a lot of time on emphasizing how for Lacan, the structure of the unconscious is like language. Also, I mean, Lacan uses structuralism to explain pretty much everything. But well, for example, I've mentioned this in my classes too. Uh, he famously writes about the schizophrenia, right? And for him, a schizophrenic is someone who cannot read a semiological chain in a series because he or she keeps going here and there. And that is a linguistic representation of schizophrenia, right? So these are all some of the insights that he provides in these pages. And then he will move into how people have used Lacanian psychoanalysis, his theory and Freud in reading literary texts. There are already hints here. I mean, he's talking about the way Lacan explains uh, the unconscious is very much like a modernist text, right? Indeterminate, open-ended, not giving us all the answers and absolutely not prom promising a realistic representation of reality, right? And so in the next lecture, then I will be finishing this series on psychoanalysis, I hope, right? And then, we'll be talking about those parts of the chapter where Eagleton takes this knowledge, takes this knowledge and shows us how to apply it to literary text. That is all I have as always. If you have any questions, please send them my way, post them in the comments or email me and I'll be happy to answer those. And I will soon be back with what I hope is the third and final <laughs>
chapter or final part of this chapter. Thank you so much and see you next time. Peace and love. Hello. So I'm back with hopefully the third and final part of my series of lectures on Terry Eagleton's chapter five on psychoanalysis. Now, until now, what we have covered in the previous two lectures is for Eagleton's discussion and explanation of basic theory of Freud. Then his discussion of Lacan's rereading of Freud and rendering it through linguistic and post-structuralist vocabularies, right? And you already have those lectures and I encourage you to uh, watch those. In this part, I will briefly dwell on mostly how he tackles the question of the usage of psychoanalysis. Like how do people use psychoanalysis, mobilize it in their literary studies, but also in their studies of cultures. And uh, I will be relying on, of course, Eagleton's own words. And he starts with, um, you know, on page 155. And he says, psychoanalytical criticism, in other words, can do more than hunt for phallic symbols, right? Um, it can tell us something about how literary texts are actually formed and reveal something of the meaning of that formation, okay? Psychoanalytical literary criticism can be broadly divided into four kinds, he says, depending on what it takes as its object of attention. And this is kind of his way of saying there are four ways people have used psychoanalytical criticism by focusing on the author, by focusing on the content of the work, by focusing on informal construction, what goes into constructing a text, and by focusing on the reader. Now, he also tells us that most of the times the critics stay focused on the first two, and that is the author and the content, right? And what he says is that most psychoanalytical criticism has been of the first two kinds, which are in fact the most limited and problematic. Uh, so the author, when you are reading about the author, it's highly speculative and, and, and it runs into the same kind of problems as we had with the retrieving the authorial intention in other kinds of scholar, uh, scholarship. And, you know, it can be about commenting on the unconscious motivations of characters. That's what a lot of people do the second part. They focus on the content. And sometimes it can be as simple as, this is an id character, this is a superego character, this is an ego character. And both of these approaches, reading the author's consciousness through Freudian slips and other things into a text, or just dwelling on the text and looking at Freudian symbols in it, Eagleton finds it, you know, not really a very exciting thing to do with psychoanalysis, right? Now, in the process of discussing this, he also tells us how certain aspects of Freudian psychoanalysis can enable us to look at literature differently. And he goes on page 157 to Freud's work on dream work, right? So remember, when the analyst asks you or me or you know, anyone else to record our dreams. The purpose is to record them as correctly as possible. But in the process, there is always what Freud terms a secondary revision. And the secondary revision of the dream is to give it a coherent narrative, right? To read whatever symbolics or anything that the unconscious is throwing at us. And on page 157, Eagleton talks about is one stage of the dream work known as secondary revision consists in the reorganization of the dream so as to present it in the form of a relatively consistent and comprehensive narrative, right? Uh, 
Now he says, well, this is kind of like literature. Most of the literary theory, he says, and I'm quoting, uh, so, so far in this book could be considered a form of secondary revision of the literary text. In this, its obsessive pursuit of harmony, coherence, deep structure, or essential meaning, such theory fills in the text gaps and smooths over its contradictions, domesticating its disparate aspects and diffusing its conflicts. It does this so that the text may be, so to speak, more easily consumed, so that the path is made straight for the reader who will not be ruffled by any unexplained irregularities. So most literary scholars that we know of or that we have read in our class do that, like look for ambiguities, look for the tension, new critics, how are those tensions resolved, how to represent the work as an organic whole. All of that is kind of rendering a text which may not be graspable in its entirety into a reduced form, a rationalized form, into a narrative structure that becomes more understandable. So in a way, a lot of the work that critics have been doing, even structuralists looking for deep structures, they were doing a secondary revision of the literary text. Even Barth at, its more, at his more uh, you know, revolutionary phase when he's talking about the writerly text, the rewriting of the text by the critic in a creative form is a secondary revision, right? And that is pretty much how Freud describes the secondary revision. So literary study, whether we are using psychoanalysis or not, is kind of like that. But what he says is that there are other critics who have used, um, you know, psychoanalysis for uh, the last two purposes, for reading the informal construction of the text itself, right? So one of them is what he calls the hermeneutics of suspicion. And its concern is not just to read the text, of the, but to uncover the processes, the dream work by which that text was produced. To do this, it focuses in particular on what have been called symptomatic places in the dream text. So this is when we're talking about the dream text, right? Now, the same hermeneutics of suspicion then can be applied to a text, right? But not to its content alone, but in a way what Pierre McCary calls the reading, the silences of the text, what the text doesn't say, right? But whatever it doesn't say, what it takes for granted is it constitutes it. Like, let me give you an example, right? For example, um, when uh, Althusser reads Capital, right? He has a book called uh, Reading Capital, right? When he reads it, what he's saying is, I'm going to read the silences of this text. What does he mean by that? What he means by that is that if we read in capital volume one, two, and three, not what Marx says, because everyone reads that, but what is left unsaid, what Marx assumes as established knowledge upon which he's building this edifice called capital volume one. By knowing what he's taking for granted and not even explaining, we can understand the text better. That is what we call reading the silences of the text. Uh, for people like me who are post-colonialists, when we do, you know, uh, when we approach a text, we don't don't just, let's say, for example, Achebe's reading of Heart of Darkness. One mode of reading is he's a racist because he says these, these things about Africans. Fine. But another mode of reading is by saying, here are so many things about Africa that are elided, that are not represented. All the African characters are silent. Only two of them speak. They are represented as victims alone. We don't know whether they are capable of rational thought. We only know of their presence on the bank of the river as this menacing presence. The adjectives that are used to describe them, all of those are hermeneutics of suspicion based in what a text elides, right? And so we can apply that to the reading of a text because that's what also goes into constructing a text. And that would be um, 
a better mode of reading the text. Then he gives us discussions of certain big names, like people like Norman Holland, which who has a famous book, I think it's called With Respect to the Readers. Now, these are the people, like Holland argues, and he is into a certain kind of empirical reading of the text, but what he go, says is that the text does something to the reader, right? Every text, when it's brought to a reader, impacts the reader in one way or the other. And the way the readers feel or experience a text also can be read as the meaning-making process. So I'm quoting from page 158. Holland sees works of literature as setting in motion in the reader an interplay of unconscious fantasies and conscious defenses against them. The work is enjoyable because by devious formal means, it transforms our deepest anxieties and desires into socially acceptable meaning. So what do we understand? We sublimate as we read it. If it did not soften these desires by its form and language, allowing us sufficient mastery of and defense against them, it would prove unacceptable. But so would it if it merely reinforced our repressions. So here is another usage of psychoanalysis, but now focusing on the reader, what a work does to a reader's consciousness, what kind of latent tendencies that does it touch upon, what does it invoke in our unconscious, and how does then it appease it or satisfy it. And so we could use psychoanalysis to read the impact of the text on the reader's consciousness, right? Then, he goes to Harold Bloom. Sorry, it's our dog uh, trying to tell me I need to take her out. So um, Harold Bloom is the one who also uses, you know, psychoanalysis to build a whole school of thought in Renaissance studies and others as well. But his term is anxiety of influence. Right? So what he does, Eagleton says, is to rewrite literary history in terms of the Oedipus complex. How does he do that? So the way Bloom suggests is that in any age, poets, right, they are anxious about their predecessors or people who are great poets in their own times, right? And they know that they are being judged against them. That's the anxiety that forces them to go into previous works, right? And then to learn to counter that, to write better, right? Or to even unravel the previous poet's work so that their own works can stand out. And that is the anxiety of influence is what, you know, Bloom considers a very creative force, right? And, and you can read his monumental book on it. But that's another use of psychoanalysis in building a whole theory of productivity and of literary writing, right? Then uh, he also touches upon on different pages on different people. He talks about Kristeva's reading of Lacan, especially, and we will probably have a lecture on this. I will record it. Uh, is Kristeva's use of um, the symbolic order being the order, law of the father. And against that, what she calls the semiotic order, that's the imaginary in Lacan and how she argues that women who write are closer to the womb and thus closer to the semiotic order and can therefore write differently. You know, it's a highly contested argument but that comes from feminism. He gives us a brief description a description of Althusser. Althusser is one of very few people who, who combines psychoanalysis, especially Lacanian psychoanalysis, of course, with Marxism, by using the theory of the subject, right, as it comes from Lacan. Now, I find Eagleton's reading of Althusser kind of a bit shoddy, but I plan to record a full lecture on it. But if anyone wants to go and read ahead about my understanding of Althusser and how he uses ideology and, um, you know, the theory of the subject formation, uh, you can read my introduction to my last book on ISIS. And I, I think I spent about 10 pages on discussing Althusser just because I was using it. 
And then uh, psychoanalysis is also very importantly used in the field of critical uh, pedagogy. And these are people who rely on studies of consciousness, studies of brain to argue about how to teach better, how to teach in a way that students actually become critically thinking human subjects. And these are the people who increasingly rely on Lacanian psychoanalysis, right? And I think the most prominent on it is Mark Brocker, his work, Radical Pedagogy. And they're also the people who talk about theory of recognition, how we all feel the need to be recognized in opposition to, uh, you know, the Marxist redistribution register. And these are some of the fields in which psychoanalysis has been used, is being used, either Lacanian or Freudian. Now, one person that I didn't mention here, of course, is uh, uh, Marcus, right? And his work, Eros and Civilization. Now, Eagleton talks about that there is a great possibility uh, where theorists and philosophers have now started talking about uh, Eros, right? And pleasure. Because remember, Freud basically acknowledges that this entire edifice of civilization is built on repression right? And that has its consequences, right? And the quote that I shared, I think, in my first lecture was Freud suggesting that a civilization that is built on uh, a few people having the maximum resources and rest of the world repressing their desires to fulfill the need of the few is, is not a viable civilization. And he does that in uh, uh, I think in his book, Civilization and Its Discontents, I think I could be wrong. But then Marcuse goes and writes his most prominent work, which is called Eros and Civilization. And he brings the Marxian dialectical materialism, right? And Freudian theory of repression and tries to theorize how to create a subject, right? Or a future in which we can create a world that is not based in repression, repression, where we can figure out a way of expressing our drives, right? It was a huge book. Another person who's crucial in, in theorizing that in, of course, Deleuze and Gothari already are out there, right? Who are philosophers of desire. But uh, from someone who combines Marxism with this also is Franco Berardi. Right, his book, uh, I have a lecture on it called uh, The Soul at Work, right? In which at one point he discusses, you know, how we ought to theorize wealth. And he says, well, maybe instead of theorizing wealth as accumulation of capital, maybe we could theorize it or talk about it as, as access to leisure time. And, and that already means that we are into pleasure, right? Or and, and create a world in which we can live in peace without neurological problems, without depression. And that also would not be possible without a knowledge of psychoanalysis, both Lacanian and Freudian. So overall, what we learned then is that and this is one of the very few chapters in which Eagleton actually goes and reads a text. So please read it and you'll see how he does it. So four ways of reading uh, is what he talks about. And those, of course, are um, you, as a mo mode of reading, four ways of reading. I'm just trying to share my screen here. Uh, what he says is that one is when we focus on the author. The second is when we work on, focus on the contents of the work. And these are the two where we are trying to look for authorial intention or we are trying to look for, uh, you know, symbols, Lacanian or Jungian symbols within a text. A lot of people do that. Eagleton doesn't consider it significant enough. What he says is that the important is the last two where we look at the libidinal and other informal construction, the structures that construct a text, right? That would be revolutionary. And then what a text does to the reader's consciousness, how does the reader respond to it and why that would be a better mode of reading. 
Then we have, you know, towards the concluding part of the chapter. Here is what I find the important part of the chapter. Um, and he says, the problems of literary value and pleasure would seem to lie somewhere at the juncture of psychoanalysis, linguistics, and ideology, and little work has been done here as yet. We know enough, however, to suspect that it is a good deal more possible to say why someone enjoys certain arrangements of words than conventional literary criticism has believed. Now, because we can say that, the reason we can say that is because we have access to psychoanalysis. We have access to Freud. We have access to Lacan. And remember, before he makes this claim, he gives us that fourth the example of baby, right? Another quote here is one of the richest traditions to have emerged from Freud's, Freud's own writing is one very far removed from the preoccupations of Lacan. It is a form of political psychoanalytical work engaged with the question of happiness as it affects whole societies, right? And I just talked about that. Eros and civilization, Franco Berardi's work. And then there are a lot of other theorists too, especially feminists who talk about pleasure, right? And how to create a world in which we can be less neurotic, less stressed, right? Where we enjoy life more, maybe where we love more, right? In opposition to this repressed society where we must repress our desires for a long time so that those can be gratified after 15 years or 20 years because that's what the civilizational structure is built on. So a lot of work is moving into those directions. Actually, the 90s entire decade was about desire, right? Most scholarly works was, were dealing with this issue of desire, but a lot of work is still needed in theorizing that. And that opens the space for, you know, discussions of reading for pleasure, right? Which is derided still in so many schools and universities. But why is it pleasurable to read, right? What does reading do for me, for my mind? What kind of unconscious desires surface when I read a work? Now, also keep in mind that critical pedagogy scholars, for example, are very strong advocates of sentimental novels and sentimental poetry. Because what their point is that when we read about our global others in a way that it's a moving account that makes us feel empathetic or sympathetic to them, that can literally rewire our brains, make us more compassionate, more caring. All of this in one way or the other is also connected to psychoanalysis. So this is where I'm going to stop. Uh, it has taken me, you know, three lectures to cover this chapter, but I'm still sure I've missed a lot of things. So overall, this is Terry Eagleton's discussion of psychoanalysis, both Lacanian and Freudian psychoanalysis and its usages. Now, of course, I'm pretty sure you'll have questions. And if you have questions, please feel free to put them in the comments, send them my way, and I'll try to answer those. And I will also try to record a separate lecture on Althusser. Until then, thank you so much and see you next time. And bye.